Welcome, and thank you for all for attending. Those of you here in Pittsburgh with us and throughout the state and the communities we serve in New York, Maryland, and Ohio. I'm Dr. Graham Snyder, Medical Director of Infection Prevention and Hospital Epidemiology for UPMC. Since our last briefing, public health authorities in all three states with UPMC facilities have announced that they've confirmed COVID-19 cases. There are no confirmed COVID-19 cases at any UPMC facility. Also since our last briefing, UPMC has sent specimens to public health authorities for testing, and we expect to continue to do so. We are not going to identify any patients being tested for COVID-19 or their location in order to protect their privacy. All proper infection prevention protocols are being followed for any such patients, as we do with all patients with infectious diseases. UPMC facilities and hospitals are safe, and we have preparedness plans in place to handle COVID-19 cases, as I laid out for you last week. Preparing for an emerging infectious disease is something UPMC has a lot of experience with. We have very good partnerships with public health authorities and our infectious diseases experts at the University of Pittsburgh. We have solid plans in place to care for patients with concerning infections. UPMC facilities and staff remain well equipped to properly care for patients with contagious diseases without exposing other patients, staff, or visitors. I would like to thank our nearly 90,000 employees for keeping themselves informed about COVID-19 and UPMC's preparedness through our internet. Your calm, educated, and compassionate response as we prepare are very appreciated. We have three experts here today to discuss topics we know the public is particularly curious about. Joining me are Dr. Alan Wells, Chief Medical, Officer, uh, Medical Director of UPMC Clinical Laboratories, Dr. David Nace, Chief Medical Officer of UPMC Senior Communities, and Dr. John Williams, Chief of Division of In Pediatric Infectious Diseases at UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. Dr. Wells. Thank you, Graham. I'm pleased to share that UPMC is working very quickly to develop a test for diagnosing patients suspected of having COVID-19. Currently, we are safely sending our samples to public health authorities at the state levels for diagnoses. We greatly appreciate their partnership, but delivering specimens to the state authorities takes time and their capacities are limited for testing. By developing our own test, we are seeking to shorten the time it takes and allow for more testing from suspected case to diagnosis. We also know that diagnostic companies such as Quest Diagnostics are beginning to offer testing capabilities at some limited specialty locations. UPMC has a long-standing partnership with Quest and we will be leveraging their testing capabilities for our patients. But again, the testing will take days and we expect these locations to be stretched for capacity. UPMC is an academic medical center, meaning we provide outstanding patient care and perform research to improve that same care. We are fortunate to have a very strong partnership with the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. As you all have heard, Pitt Center for Vaccine Research is pursuing development of a COVID-19 vaccine and a few weeks ago was one of the first such centers to receive samples of the SARS-CoV-2 the virus that causes COVID-19 disease. Their director, Paul Dupre, is safely sharing genetic samples with our labs to assist in the development of our diagnostic test. These partnerships are what make UPMC Pitt unique and world-class institutions for our medical care. We will answer questions about test development later, but first, Dr. Nace will tell you about the preparedness of the UPMC senior communities. David. Thank you, Alan, and good morning. UPMC provides secure and friendly surroundings to nearly 3,000 older adults 
residing in 30 UPMC senior communities throughout the region. There are no confirmed cases of COVID-19 in any of these facilities. I know there's been heightened awareness around long-term care and skilled facilities due to the unfortunate and distressful situation at a nursing home in Seattle. I want to assure the communities that we serve that UPMC is prepared to safely care for our older adults. We have plans in place to detect a potential COVID-19 case in our senior communities and quickly get testing performed. We have proper infection control precautions and protocols in place, and our staff are educated about COVID-19 and the proper personal protective equipment to use to safely care for any COVID-19 patients. In addition to guiding COVID-19 preparedness for UPMC and our long-term care and skilled facilities, I am president-elect and soon to be president of AMDA, the Society for Post-Acute and Long-Term Care Medicine. I've helped to co-direct the development of AMDA's guidance on COVID-19 in post-acute and long-term care settings, which is being shared with these facilities nationwide and also with public health authorities and adopted by the CDC and their guidance to these facilities. I'd like to ask the public not to visit their loved ones uh, in person at a long-term care facility or a skilled nursing facility if they are ill or they have cold symptoms, even relatively minor ones. Uh, this will help us avoid accidentally spreading not only COVID-19, but many of the common respiratory viruses that are circulating in our communities and to our um, vulnerable elderly population. I'll be happy to answer your questions after we hear from Dr. John Williams on the impact of COVID-19 in children. Good morning. Thanks, David. As a global leader in the care of children and a pioneer in the development of new improved pediatric therapies, the UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, uh, along with our partners at the Pitt Center for Vaccine Research, has been involved in COVID-19 preparation for months now. Uh, we have not had yet a suspected case at our flagship children's hospital or any of our pediatric uh, practices or facilities. As with any infectious disease epidemic, children are a special population. Some infectious diseases like influenza can strike young children, even adolescents, harder than otherwise healthy young adults. While there's still a lot to learn about COVID-19, it appears that the opposite is true here. Um, symptoms seem to be much milder in children. Recent data from China suggests that children are infected at rates similar to adults, but have milder disease. That may be good news for pediatricians. What we do know about infectious diseases in children uh, and we suspect is true about COVID-19, is that children are very good at spreading disease even when uh, they may not feel very sick because they can be running around playing and yet be infected. Um, for that reason, we ask parents and caregivers uh, to take three steps to help us contain the spread of infection. One is practicing good hand hygiene. Help your children to use soap and water to wash their hands for 20 seconds enough time to sing the happy birthday song twice or the ABC song. Uh, hand sanitizer gel also works and is very portable. And hands should be washed often before and after going to the bathroom, every time we cough or sneeze, uh, after touching common use surfaces like playground toys uh, and uh, communal playground equipment, um, and before eating. Number two, teach children to cover their mouth when they're sneezing or coughing. Many illnesses are transmitted by respiratory droplets, which travel a few feet through the air after a cough or a sneeze. Show children how to cough into their elbow or to cough and sneeze into a tissue and throw it away. If they cough or sneeze into their hands, they can use hand gel or soap and water to then wash their hands. And third, keep kids home if they're sick. If a child has a fever, they should be kept home and not return to school or daycare until they have 24 hours fever-free without using a fever-reducing medicine such as Tylenol. You can consult a healthcare provider while keeping your child at home by using the UPMC Anywhere Care app or the Children's PGH app. Uh, these apps have a Save My Spot uh, option for our Children's Express Care locations. This service helps families from having to wait in a crowded waiting room uh, and can cut down on exposure to other sick children. 
Doing these things is not only important for COVID-19, but for the other respiratory viruses, such as influenza, that are circulating in our community right now. We appreciate the support of our parents, teachers, and families in helping reduce the spread of disease. I'll take questions momentarily. Okay. Thank you, doctors. And thank you to you in the media outlets that serve our communities and for your responsible reporting on COVID-19 and UPMC's preparedness. We'll now take questions. We have multiple regional outlets tuning into our live stream, and they have submitted questions, so I'll intersperse those with the questions of the reporters in the room. I'll ask our experts to please pause before answering so I can summarize the question into the microphone for those watching remotely. Questions? Yes. With regards to um, seniors, um, what we've done over uh, a number of years, over the last uh, couple of decades, is to enhance our infection control um, programs, including our surveillance and outbreak detection and management programs. Uh, what we've uh, uh, accomplished over this uh, two-decade uh, period has uh, been a very strong and robust program that has been used actually um, to teach and inform other facilities across the country uh, for early outbreak detection. And uh, we have uh, incorporated that actually in training programs that we've uh, led for um, facilities across this country. So I think we're relatively well prepared um, for uh, detecting an outbreak should it occur uh, in an older adult uh, population. So. As, a, as an organization, we are focused on the epidemiology of this disease. Um, in Pennsylvania, for the few cases we've had there and, and throughout the United States generally, Cases are still predominantly identified by travel to affected areas, for example, countries where transmission is happening, and additionally in contact with people who have been diagnosed with COVID-19. And so for all of our patients, we're still focused on that epidemiology. Additionally, we're considering COVID-19 in patients who have fever and respiratory illness without an alternative cause. So we're asking clinicians whether they be uh, taking care of kids, um, elderly or um, the general population that they pay attention to the possibility of COVID-19 in their patient and discuss it. Is there something specific that you're doing differently? I think the epidemiology is the same. So whether you're a child traveler or an elderly tra traveler or an adult traveler, um, the epidemiology is still the same. Right. And I would just say the same kind of testing is used for children and adults. All right, Sarah. The question is, with the distinction that the State Department of Health is making between positive cases and presumed positive cases, are there any presumed positive cases at UPMC? There are no presumed or confirmed positive cases at UPMC. Yes, Sean. Can you tell us how many tests you've so far? Can you tell us how many tests have been performed so far? We're going to follow the lead of CDC and PADOH by not disclosing the number of tests that we've performed. I'm now going to take a question from the Williamsport Sun Gazette. Are there current updates and procedures regarding the virus and how UPMC hospitals in, say, Lycoming County or the state are dealing with patients who have coronavirus? So we're preparing all of our organization, whether it's a small facility in a rural area or a large academic medical center. In, uh, in Pittsburgh to be prepared to identify and uh, take appropriate care of a patient with COVID-19. And there are no differences whether it's a small facility, whether it's an outpatient facility or an inpatient facility, same level of preparation to identify and take the appropriate precautions um, when a patient could have COVID-19. The question is, what is the timeline locally for testing, both at the state and with UPMC's development of testing? So we are working to quickly institute a test, first for our most symptomatic patients, to get to the point of presumed uh, positive or negative, uh, requiring confirmation in very short order. We'll be rolling out additional tests after that for other targeted populations. But what's the time? 
So we're talking within that period. Yes. There are very, there are many unknowns when developing a test, and that is what is, has come up with the CDC, with other centers, so there is no definitive timeline. All right, next question. All right, yes. All right, so the, the question is, if somebody walks into an ER with symptoms consistent with COVID-19, how do you protect everyone else? So for all of our frontline providers, whether it's emergency department, urgent care, outpatient clinic office, we've taught our providers to rec first recognize the potential. Part of that comes from our travel screen, travel to affected areas, and part of it comes from recognizing potential symptoms that could be COVID-19. Um, the first steps are identify, mask the patient, get the patient to a safe area to continue to provide care, and then we have 24-7 coverage by an infection preventionist to assist that facility with walking through the process of evaluating the patient and, if appropriate, testing and, and further care. All right, I'm going to take a question from WJAC-TV in Johnstown. Um, are there symptoms dependent on a particular age bracket? How do doctors go about testing for and treating in children, and what challenges do they face when treating kids? Maybe I'll take the pediatric part first, and then the David take the, the older adult part. So, you know, data are still limited. It's early uh, in, in the spread of this virus, but all the data we have, which is mostly now from China regarding children, shows that children have milder disease. In fact, many of the children identified as infected with the virus were identified through contact tracings of hospitalized patients going out and looking at their families. So there have been very few severe cases in children uh, and very few hospitalized children, which is good news for pediatricians and parents. Yeah, with regards to older adults, I think the, the thing that's very important to, to understand is that the symptoms can overlap with other respiratory viral illnesses. Uh, we know that COVID-19 in older adults tends to be a, um, a more severe disease, potentially. Um, but um, th that is very common with other respiratory viruses as well. The, the, the impact is, is increased. So having that in your differential diagnosis and knowing to, to think about um, those other things that are common, uh, including influenza, influenza H1N1 is, is uh, widely circulating at this point in time in the, uh, in the community. So uh, we have to pay attention to that um, and look at the other things that are, are common. Um, but using your, your clinical judgment and seeing if an individual meets the, the uh, case definitions that have been used, including the travel history, the potential for exposure to other individuals that may have had the virus. Okay. Um, yes. Yeah, I don't think you've asked yet. Go ahead. How long until testing in the UPMC system would be available? Well, currently there is testing capabilities through the UPMC system. We are sending to the state and the federal authorities of the different states that we cover. We cover three states. Um, and we will be continuing that. Uh, the own in-house testing is under development and there are uncertainties with any test development. But as addressed um, earlier, we are expediting this and expect to have it within a short period of time. Um, yes, Sean. All right, so the question is the epidemiology of the cases. Um, are you lowering the threshold now that the CDC has expanded uh, its recommended testing group? The CDC guidance doesn't exactly say anybody who wants to get tested should be tested. The CDC and our public health colleagues are still asking us to focus on what's likely um, to be happening for this patient. So, for example, if I had a patient, as Dr. Nace mentioned, who walks in before COVID-19 ever existed and they have fever and they have respiratory symptoms, the epidemiology there is it's very likely to be influenza. Um, and there's a multitude of other respiratory viruses. Similarly, in this situation, 
What we're being asked to do from an epidemiologic standpoint, if I have a patient who comes in with fever and respiratory symptoms, what's the likelihood that it's one of the multitude of respiratory viruses, including influenza, that's circulating, and what makes it more likely to be COVID-19 disease? And right now, as we closely observe in the epidemiology both around the world and in the United States and in Pennsylvania, uh, you're most likely in the United States to still to be getting COVID-19 if you've traveled somewhere where you've been exposed to it or you've come in contact with a person who has COVID-19. So far, we're seeing very few of any cases in which somebody did not have one of those exposures. So when we target um, uh, testing, so we wanna, um, when we wanna consider a patient for COVID-19 testing, that's what's in our mind. We wanna test those patients who are most likely to have COVID-19, rather than test everybody, because if somebody doesn't have one of those exposures for right now in the United States and in our region, it's still unlikely that you would have COVID-19 if you haven't had one of those exposures. But you still have patients who have not traveled somewhere and have not been in touch with somebody who had COVID-19 that you tested because you've done the influenza test, it's come back uh, negative, they still have the symptoms. Are there folks in that category? So from, from state and CDC guidance, that's still an important category to be thinking about because at some point in the U.S. epidemic, um, it will, the, the epidemiology will switch from travel to an affected country or contact with COVID-19 and community transmission will start. So the idea there is to pay attention to patients who have no other alternative I identified cause and consider testing them because it could be one of the first patients that we have that is, has, does not have that epidemiology. That's what, that's right. what right. community transmission okay. is. Yeah. All right. We're, we're not disclosing mm -hmm. the testing that we've done. Yes, Paul. Um, Dr. Steiner, uh, what would happen, what's the next step for you So the, mm -hmm. so the question is, if you get a suspected case of COVID-19, if it walks into the hospital or, or a presumed positive case, what changes within that hospital? So the key interventions that you'd put in place for COVID-19 are the infection prevention precautions to prevent transmission. And so part of that is personal protective equipment that's specific to COVID-19, but it's the same personal protective equipment we use to prevent transmission of other infections. And so this is actually something that we do every day in infection prevention, whether somebody could have a diagnosis of tuberculosis, measles, methicillin-resistant staph aureus. So we follow the CDC guidelines on how to prevent transmission based on the presumed mechanism of transmission for uh, SARS-CoV-2 that causes COVID-19. So any facility, whether it's a hospital, urgent care, ED, uh, outpatient care facility, they're ready to apply those precautions to prevent transmission in that, in that location. All right, I'm gonna take another question. This one, again, from the Williamsport Sun Gazette. Uh, what treatment is being used in UPMC hospitals to take care of patients who have co coronavirus, or I suppose if they were to be diagnosed with coronavirus? So the primary treatment for patients diagnosed with COVID-19 is supportive care. We have experts in our system who have reviewed the data for alternative treatments, none of which have been approved for care, but have been used in some settings, and, and are, are able to provide our, our providers with guidance on what um, treatments have the best level of evidence and have less evidence, and make sure that those treatments are available to, to clinicians. One example, perhaps at the top of the list, is remdesivir. Um, it's right now a drug that's not been approved for use, but is under investigation, including clinical trials, and holds the most promise. And we have already opened up communications to make sure that if we had a patient with COVID-19 and the clinicians thought appropriate to treat with this agent, that, that we would make that agent available. Okay. Um, yes, Sarah. Okay, so the question is, if there is somebody in one of the UPMC senior communities with COVID-19, would they remain in the residence? Yeah, that's an, an excellent question. And uh, it depends on uh, which of the senior communities. So if it's one of our nursing facilities, um, we would hopefully um, uh, 
uh, try to maintain that person in place if we could. So it's dependent upon, first and foremost, patient-centered care. So what's important about this is some individuals uh, have decided that they don't want to go back to the hospital. They want to stay where they are uh, because of their health uh, status and their overall prognosis. Um, we would take that into account in the decision making. We would also look at the medical needs. So if the person needs higher level hospital based care, ventilator care, something like that, uh, that would be an indication for transfer, in which case we would coordinate that with our EMS providers, uh, with the public health service obviously, and with the hospital um, that's receiving the individual as well. So. Um, So the, the follow-up is, if somebody is in their room at a senior community with COVID-19, do you feel safe that you can keep their neighbors from contracting it? Yeah, so uh, as part of the programs that we've developed, um, we've trained our uh, facility staff on the use of personal protective equipment, or otherwise known as PPE, uh, including gowns, gloves, and masks. Um, we have uh, done that on an annual basis. We do that on a frequent basis, pretty much monthly. Uh, and then anytime there is anything circulating, including the current flu, neurovirus season, um, and we've um, re-emphasized that uh, throughout the, the, the entire process. So it's an ongoing uh, formal training and informal point of, you know, hey, I just observed you going in and out of this room. This is what's happening. So there's constant reminders that are going so that we can, can be prepared um, and I'm comfortable that our staff know what to do in, in, in terms of that. Okay, yes. I know you talked about the vaccine being in the works. Any update on the status of that? Uh, I know you've talked about a vaccine being in works. Any update on the status of that being available? You know, I think uh, a vaccine, as, as you've probably heard from our, our um, national public health colleagues, uh, uh, even if, vac if a vaccine is ready, that is, it's been prepared, it still has to undergo testing, and so I think we're months, months off. Yes. I ask just one of the most basic questions only because I continue to hear it asked when people call in the radio and I hear it out on the street from one friend. And that is why we and you uh, should we be more concerned about this uh, COVID-19 than we are with influenza and, and similar uh, viruses. Why should we be more concerned? So the question is, should we be more concerned, and why, if so, should we be more concerned about COVID-19 than other viruses such as influenza? I think as a community, we should have the right level of concern for influenza and COVID-19. It's not that one is more important than the other. Influenza is important because it's here. It's here every season. It hospitalizes hundreds of thousands every season. Unfortunately, tens of thousands die every season. And um, we can mitigate the effects of influenza with a vaccine and appropriate care, and we have treatment available for it. So influenza is important. COVID-19 is also important. COVID-19 is important because it's a new disease. It's a disease that we have an opportunity to prevent the transmission of. It's a disease that um, we can minimize the effects by um, uh, some of the interventions that you see take place from public health um, agencies around the world, whether that be social distancing, the fundamentals of case identification and contact tracing. So COVID-19 is important. As a Pennsylvania resident, am I concerned about influenza and COVID-19? I'm concerned about them both. I'm concerned about influenza and I do the respiratory etiquette that Dr. Williams talked about because I don't want to get influenza. But I also realize that we can count the number of, of, of cases of COVID-19 in the state on my fingers and I have to understand that that's the magnitude of risk for me here. And so as a resident of Pennsylvania, I'm paying attention to what's happening. I'm listening to my public health authorities, whether that be Allegheny County Health Department, the state, or the CDC, all good sources for information, and following their lead on what I should do to prepare. I have another regional question that I'd like to ask. Um, if this is a seasonal virus like flu, when and how would that become apparent to you? We are, uh, as, a, as a scientist, um, I'm very interested in knowing whether this is going to have a seasonal predilection. Uh, it's going to also have important uh, ramifications for public health. Unfortunately, we don't know yet. And we're not going to know until we start to roll through some seasons and colleagues can study the seasonal patterns of, of COVID-19 and the risk of transmission in different um, um, conditions. Thank you. Uh, yes, Sean. No. Is so, the test that you're developing the same as the CDC's? 
Yes, we're developing the test based on the CDC protocol. We are not using their kits because they're in limited supply. We're developing a parallel uh, method that qualifies for the CDC uh, EUA, Emergency Youth Authorization Waiver, uh, and we're doing that to speed the test development. Any other? Yes. How long until UPMC campuses regionally, such as in Erie, would have those testing capabilities? So UPMC Health System and the clinical labs are a network. They, from the beginning when that test is available, they would be sending to our centralized test lab. Our test is developed under what's called a laboratory developed test, an LDT, so it would only valid for the location in which it is developed and we have we already send testing from Erie and throughout UPMC hospital facilities to our central uh, laboratory building or CLB here in Oakland and we will continue to do that for this test so the capabilities will be the same for all of the UPMC facilities at the same time based on following our clinical colleagues lead a uh, prioritization of people to be tested. All right, I have another question from a regional outlet. Um, given the ongoing spread in the U.S. and elsewhere, do you think the public should be more concerned than they were when you updated us a week ago? Uh, instead of concerned, I'd say um, we should all remain vigilant and educated about it. And again, I'd, I'd refer um, viewers and listeners to and, and, um, and, and neighbors in the community to our public health resources, uh, the CDC, the state, and the Allegheny County Health Department pages, as well as other regional health department pages, all provide great information on COVID-19. So instead of saying uh, more concerned, I would say we should remain as vigilant as we've been about it. Um, yeah, Sean. This question is for Dr. Nace, and it's if you have implemented any barriers within the senior communities in the outright bands that people might see. Yeah, it, um, uh, it's, a, it's a great question because there's a lot of uh, concern about that I know across the country in terms of how do you deal with visitors. Um, what we have been doing um, already because of the flu season, um, since the fall, we have been uh, posting uh, signs to say if you have illness, please do not come into the building. So we've already taken those steps. We are now upping that. Uh, to remind that it also involves uh, preparations uh, uh, for the uh, prevention of COVID-19. Um, so the signage is, is, is continuing. Um, we do talk with uh, patients and families with regards to that um, uh, as necessary. And, and uh, in terms of outright banning of visitors, we're not doing that. Um, it's very important when you have somebody who is 90 years old and is a hospice patient, uh, that they have non-ill family members with them. Uh, as necessary. So we haven't, we haven't restricted all visitation. Uh, we have continued to allow that. We are in the process of uh, putting out communications with our, with our patients, with our families, uh, and, and other visitors to uh, let them know the steps that we're taking uh, and also reminding them of the fact that if they are ill, please do not come in. So. All right, we have five minutes remaining. Any other questions in the room? Sure, go ahead. <laughs> Again, so, it might be so I'm going to attempt to summarize this, um, but you heard the question. Mm -hmm. So is it wrong to say that UPMC has tested people or for any reason other than travel or exposure? 
again, I'll follow the public health guidance and not disclose the specific details of our testing. Um, but I will also say that um, we understand that uh, searching for a, a COVID-19 positive patient, somebody who's ill with COVID-19, might entail in travel to affected areas, contact with COVID-19, or somebody who is ill without an alternative cause. So I pair looking for those um, conditions with what's the epidemiology that's happening. And this, I, you have the same information that I do about um, what's happening in Pennsylvania, what's happening around the country. So our public health authorities are the ones who are doing those tests so that they would be able to answer those questions if that's information they want to disclose. Right now, they are the ones running the tests and have to date. Uh, yes, Paul. All right. This so, question is directed at Dr. Wells. Can you expand upon the challenges to developing a test? So I should say at first, the um, virology team of doctors Fan, Mitchell, and Ronaldo have developed tests and have I in the past for new infectious diseases and emerging infectious diseases or just tests that didn't exist for existing infectious diseases. So this is nothing new. Obviously, the challenges relate around sensitivity, um, off-target effects of other diseases that mimic, so you're specific, and of whether or not you can detect patients who are both symptomatic and either pre- or post-symptomatic. And the challenges specifically for COVID-19 uh, or SARS-CoV-2 for that is, fortunately, we don't have positive patients to run around with the disease to be testing. So for flu, if we're developing a new flu test and we developed the flu test before they were commercially available, we had lots of flu patients. We developed a better test than the culture test. So we had plenty of positives and negatives to compare and we could find out quickly sensitivity specificity. With an emerging disease, or many of the bioterrorism threats that we've developed tests for and very fortunately have never had to use. The question is, how do you develop, how do you know your sensitivity and specificity? So those are the unknowns. How do you that? In this case, we don't have how do you develop that? So how are you developing the sensitivity and specificity? You simulate patients from safe genetic material that in this case is available through Dr. Dupre at the Center of Vaccine Research and other sources, but it's still not true patient material. All right, we have temper. Did the, did the CDC give you details on their experience with sensitivity the and specificity? The CDC has been very forthcoming in publishing all of their protocols and experiences online to qualified uh, laboratory personnel who can make sense of it. And we have, through the virology team, have been in touch, as has Dr. Williams, with uh, experts at the CDC elsewhere and overseas who have shared experiences. But this is still a very evolving situation. And as Dr. Snyder has said, we will know more as more develops. It's still, we're still learning. All right, one, one last question. We have time for one last question. Yes.
So the question is, since testing is limited outside of travel and known exposure, are there any groups that you would particularly want to test right away? No. So we have asked any, um, any provider who is concerned their patient may have COVID-19 to call 24-7 the infection prevention team so that we can help that provider determine whether it be travel, whether it be contact with a COVID-19 patient, or whether it be a respiratory disease without an alternative cause, we can decide collaboratively with that provider whether or not testing would be helpful for that patient to identify COVID-19. And that concludes the time we have allotted. Thank you all for attending. We plan to continue holding these regular updates for media as long as they are needed. In the meantime, reporters with questions are encouraged to contact our UPMC Media Relations Department at upmc.com slash media. Please follow at UPMC News on Twitter for updates. Thank you.